3D Design for 3D Printing Tutorial 5. Today we learn how to extend on shape and create screw threads, working spur gears, including how to test them inside an assembly. This video is part of a series on learning 3D design for making custom 3D printed parts using a free OnShape account. I'll link the playlist below so you can see the previous episodes, including how to make an account and set up your units. Today we expand on our ability to create functional parts by learning how to make screw threads, spur gears and testing them in an assembly. What we're designing today is essentially a fidget toy. It serves no particular purpose but it does have some important features that translate to other designs. The first is spur gears, suitable for motor driven mechanisms. And the second is accurate 3D printed screw threads. So you can model thread into your parts for metal hardware to go into or completely 3D printed parts that screw together. Although the end result of this tutorial is a fidget toy, the very same 3D modeling techniques will allow you to design complex mechanisms, like when I used them to create a 3D printed paste extruder in a previous video. Although we don't need to measure any real life items for this video, I have linked this basic metric thread chart below. When we're creating our threads, it's handy to know the pitch that we need for a given size. You will see coarse pitch and fine pitch, and most of the time the nuts and bolts you buy from a hardware store will be coarse pitch, so pay the most attention to this left hand column. Now you won't find buttons in the toolbar for creating threads or creating spur gears in Onshape by default, but fortunately we can extend its functionality quite easily with something called Feature Script. You may have noticed on the right hand side of your toolbar we have this button with a plus and it says Add Custom Features. And if I click the down arrow, you can see the features that I've already added in the past. All of these are examples of extending on shape with feature script. And here's an example of how it works. Someone creates a script that enables additional features, but don't be turned off. We don't need to understand the way this script works at all to use this additional functionality. To install a new feature script, we can be in any of our documents and then we come up and click on the plus, add custom features. If you're just browsing, you can click on feature script samples and you'll see quite a few come up. You can also click on community spotlight and you'll have a nice selection once again. If you like, you can also go directly to the Onshape forum in the feature script section and look there. Of course, we can always use Google by typing in Onshape feature script and then whatever feature we're after. And if it's been created, there'll be a link to the forums where it's been posted. To install this or any other feature scripts, we need the URL. So I'm going to highlight and copy and then back in Onshape, paste it into the URL field, click the magnifying glass icon to search. The document should then show up and we can click through until we see an icon for the exact feature script. We click on this and we'll have a notification in the middle of the screen saying it's been permanently added to the toolbar. And we can check this by clicking the down arrow and making sure it's there. Sometimes the authors will update their feature script and we can see the little blue icon in the corner here. In those cases, we can right click, go to update, and then update all. And a few seconds later, you'll be up to date. And of course, if you ever want to remove a feature script, we can do that too, by right clicking it and going to the remove option. Before we continue, please pause the video, go down to the description and find the two URLs to install the spur gear and three creator feature scripts. So into Onshape, and if you want to create a new document, we come to Create Document. But instead, I'll be adding to the TT Tutorials doc, which is linked in the description below. I'm going to come down to the plus, and then come up to Create Part Studio, and then right click and rename this tab immediately. The first feature script we'll try is the Thread Creator, and the basis we need for this can be done on a single sketch. And here you see some fast forward motion of me modeling a basic nut and bolt. If you don't know how to do this, I'd recommend going back to the first tutorial, which goes over creating sketches and applying constraints in much more detail. The first tutorial also covers how to turn these 2D sketches into 3D geometry by using basic extrude tools. So what we've created here that our feature script needs are an external and internal cylindrical surface. And we can now come up to the corner, hit the arrow and select Thread Creator. We start by selecting which face we'd like to turn into a thread, and we'll start with the external thread. 
instantly we get a preview of the thread, but we need to change it to the right type. I'm aiming for M6 here, which is ISO standard, and we can see that the feature script has automatically named the thread M6 by one for its M6 diameter and one millimeter pitch. And according to our table for an M6 thread, one millimeter pitch is correct. So that means the default pitch of one millimeter as shown here is correct already. Some options we have are clicking start taper, which will add a little chamfer to the start of the thread to help it engage. We can also decide if we want the thread to go the whole way down the bolt or just a certain distance or amount of turns. And finally, we have a button to toggle the end of the cylinder that the thread will start from. An option you most likely won't need, particularly for a normal thread, is the number of starts. Some lead screws have more than one start, and it is difficult to tell by just looking at it, but in this case, we have two helixes wrapping around each other the whole way down the bolt. But this is not how a normal M6 bolt functions, so I'm putting it back to one and hitting the tick. I'll now repeat for the internal thread, which works in much the same way. We click on our cylinder, change to ISO standard, the default settings are exactly what we need, and the name has been correctly determined as an M6 by one thread, so we can click the tick to complete our nut and bolt. I did test print these just to check for clearances, and I found that by default, with the nature of 3D printing, everything was too tight for the threads to engage. That was evident if I used a combination of 3D printed and real nuts and bolts, or both 3D printed nuts and bolts. So let's look at an efficient way to edit our design to create more clearance by using our feature list on the left hand side. Rather than delete these two features, make the change and then recreate them again, we're going to use the rollback bar and it's the horizontal line that we're going to drag above the two thread features, and this will have the effect of temporarily turning them off. Any edits we make now are as if we went back in time to before they were created. We'll now come up to our toolbar and select move face, select the face of our cylinder, and apply an offset of 0.25 millimeters, a value I arrived on after some trial and error. We'll toggle the direction to make sure the cylinder is getting smaller, and then we'll click the tick. An alternate method to making this change would be to edit the original dimension in the sketch. And using move face adds 0.25 millimeters to each side or the radius. Here we're editing the diameter, so the new value would be 6.5 millimeters. But I've already moved the face, so I'll cancel the changes to the sketch and then repeat the same command on the internal cylinder, again moving at 0.25 millimeters and toggling the direction to make the hole larger. We can then drag the rollback bar below our two thread features. They'll be recreated to suit the new geometry. And now our 3D printed nut and bolt has the correct clearances we need for it to work. These clearances got the nut and bolt working for 3D printed versus 3D printed or metal versus 3D printed. I also repeated the same test prints for a larger M10 by 1.5 millimeter pitch thread. And again, found that offsetting the face 0.25 millimeters was perfect. That's Thread Creator, so what about spur gears? To use the spur gear feature script, once again we need a sketch as the basis, but this sketch can be quite simple. However, I like to make it more elaborate than it needs to be, simply to plan out exactly where the gears will be, their size, and how they mesh. I do this with two construction line circles, and for this example, I'm gonna dimension them as 20 and 40 millimeters respectively, giving me a gearing ratio of two to one. Like with any feature script, we come up to our drop down in the upper right and select the one we want, this time spur gear. By default, it tries to put the spur gear at the origin of the document, but if we click on a vertex in our sketch we've set up, it will be moved to that position, correcting the location as well as the orientation. There's lots of options here. The first is the simplest, and that's the depth or thickness of the gear. Whatever value we enter here will dictate this. A lot of the other parameters are quite technical, and fortunately we don't need to understand them completely to get a workable result. So let's concentrate on those we do need to understand. The first thing I recommend doing is changing the mode from module to diametral pitch, and then inputting the pitch circle diameter to match the construction line you drew earlier. In my case, 20 millimeters. Some of the options down the bottom are a little easier to understand, such as choosing between straight cut or helical gears. We can even tick the box for double helix to create a herringbone gear, which used to be popular on 3D printer Wade's extruders. We also have a button we can tick to add chamfers to the upper and lower surfaces, but for 3D printing, those steep overhangs on the underside probably aren't ideal. Probably an essential option is ticking the box for center bore, 
and this will place a hole in the very middle of the gear. We can change the diameter, for instance 5mm to suit the output of a stepper motor, and if we need to, we can tick keyway and enter the dimensions for that, so we can key the output of a motor shaft to the gear we're creating. I don't need that for this example, so I'm going to turn it off and click the tick to finish the gear. I'll then repeat the tool to create the second spur gear, again setting the mode to diametral pitch and setting my pitch circle diameter. However, when I'm finished with this tool, we can see an obvious problem where the size of the teeth don't match between the two gears, so here's how to fix that. We're going to double click to edit our initial gear, and we can have many fine teeth or chunkier large teeth, but I would recommend inputting the number of teeth as a number that's easy to work with, in our case, setting the number of teeth to 20 to match our diameter. After this happens, we'll need to come down and correct our pitch circle diameter once again, but once we've done this, we're finished with our edit. We're going to make the same edit on the second gear, matching 40 for the number of teeth and the pitch circle diameter, and once we save the change, although they're not aligned here visually, we can see that the profile of the teeth match perfectly. Let's put these design features together into a single item. We are using tools that we've covered in detail before, so we're going to go quite quickly. I start by creating a 2D sketch to plan out the overall object, including construction line circles for my two gears. I then use arcs, circles and lines to draw out the rest of the frame, so I have a bit hanging at the end that I can hold on to. As always, I'm looking to add dimensions and constraints until everything is black and then I can finish the sketch. I then use the spur gears feature script to create my two spur gears, like before, matching my construction line for the pitch circle diameter, and also matching the number of teeth in the same ratio, like I showed you in the previous example. This ensures that the profile of the gear teeth will mesh correctly. I can then extrude the handle and frame in two sections, giving my gears a structure to bolt to, and all that remains now is a top cover. So I start another sketch on the top surface, trace the features from underneath, and use this to extrude the final part of the handle. To finish off, I use the thread creator feature script, just like we did earlier, to create an M6 by 1mm thread and I repeat this for all three of the holes. And like before, I used the move face tool to create an extra 0.25 millimeters of clearance for each of my threads. To finish off, I'd like to illustrate one more point, and that's that the spur gears created with this feature script a solid geometry and can be edited in much the same way as any other geometry. So in this case, to make the 3D print require less material, I drew a circular pattern, which I then extruded as a cut through the spur gear, which then gave me my final geometry ready to 3D print. Before we print out our design, let's test it with a moving assembly. One thing we haven't done so far is to do anything besides a part studio, but we can actually have assemblies as well. We'll set up a brief example of one so we can see how it works. Rather than create a new one, we'll use the default one that's set up with every new document. At the moment this will be empty and we have quite a lot of tabs now so let's drag it over just to help our visual organization. To start on the assembly we want to come up and press the insert button and this will list everything in my current document. I'm going to click on threads and gears and then as you can see it's attempting to insert all of these parts ready for us to use. I click on the window to place them and then on the green tick to complete the action. It looks like they're in position, but unlike a part studio, we can click and drag any items around because they're completely unconstrained. So what we're going to do now is constrain them using something called mates to get them into the position where they should be in real life. The simplest of these mates is called a fastened mate, and we use it for parts that don't move. The dialog box is prompting us to choose two mate connectors, and what it wants us to do is to pick two bits of geometry that match each other to align the parts. I'm going to use this outer radius, and when I hover over it, the mate connector snaps to the center of the arc. So I can click to place it, and then rotate the camera, and click on the matching arc of the piece that's adjacent. Instantly the two parts snap together, using the alignment of the geometry I selected. But if something is not quite right with yours, we have a couple of buttons to assist. These are flip primary axis, and reorient secondary axis and we can click them to flip the parts around until they're facing the right direction. These two halves of my handle are now mated together. We can tell this because if we click and drag one, the other one moves with it. Just to lock everything down, I recommend adding a mate between the origin and another piece of geometry, and the preview will only show the part that you clicked, so if you want to see where everything will end up, 
you can click the solve button and it will show you a preview of everything fully resolved. This mate is done, so let's click the tick. So let's get these spurgies into position with some more complicated mates that allow them to rotate. Instead of a fixed mate, this time we want a revolute mate because the gears revolve. Setting the connectors is exactly the same. I use the center of the spur gear and then select the adjacent hole on the handle and the two will snap together into position. Click the tick and then test drag the gear. We can see that it can rotate freely, but it's constrained in every other way. So let's create an identical mate for the second spur gear, locking it to the handle and testing that it can rotate freely too. To get our gears to interact with each other, we need to add a gear relation. And to complete this, we simply need to click on our two revolute mates. And to input our gear ratio, which for us is 2 to 1. When we click and drag the gears, we can see that they are meshing, but the ratio is wrong. So instead of a relation ratio of 2 to 1, let's try 0.5 to 1. And when we confirm that, we can see that our gears are meshing with the correct ratio. However, visually, their alignment isn't quite right, so let's fix that next. If we come over to the left and click to expand one of our Revolute mates, we can then double click on one of them to edit and change the angle. In the dialog box that opens up, let's come up and click move, and then under rotation angle, experiment with the angle until we find one that gets everything right, in my case, nine degrees. If we save our change and zoom in, we now have a perfect meshing of our spur gears, which is very satisfying. Now this is just a simple example, and if we look along the toolbar, we can see there's a lot of different types of mates and some different type of relations too. If you are wondering what any of them do, simply click on them and then click on the question mark and you'll have either a video or an animated example explaining what it does and exactly how to do it. With our assembly simulated, it was time to print and I printed with my Prusa Mini and its smaller nozzle size for the threaded parts and my Ratrig V-Core 3 for the actual spur gears. For this simple example, PLA is fine for my material, but if you wanted a deep dive into which material is best for functional gears, I've linked a Maker's Muse video below. The first thing I tested was an M6 bolt and the clearance was absolutely perfect, screwing in as if it was going into a metal nut. I then screwed the two halves of the handle together properly and then inserted each of the screws for the spur gears, making sure they weren't too tight to restrict movement. And what I found is that everything operated as it should, which was immensely satisfying. So there you have it. We've stepped up our game with new skills and knowledge. And the extra clearance you need for working threads might differ for your printer, but hopefully you at least have a starting point. Get your requests for future tutorials in the comments down below. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, happy designing custom parts for 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.